Okay, well, we're pleased to have uh, a guest speaker at our research seminar today, uh, Professor Randall Stevens, who uh, is based at uh, the University of Oslo, where he's Professor of American and British Studies. He's previously taught at uh, the University of Northumbria here in the UK, uh, as well as Eastern Nazarene College in Massachusetts. Uh, some of you may be familiar with his work as a historian of religion, conservatism, and uh, environmentalism in the South and popular culture. And uh, he's author of several books um, by, uh, published by Harvard University Press, The Fire Spreads Holiness uh, and Pentecostalism in the American South, The Anointed Evangelical Truth in a Secular Age, and uh, The Devil's Music, How Christians Inspired, Condemned, and uh, Embraced Rock and Roll. Uh, and on a personal uh, note, uh, Randall and I are both uh, from uh, the same town, Olathe in Kansas. Uh, so we go, go way back. Um, in fact, uh, almost to the beginning of my life uh, as uh, when I first went to nursery, uh, Randall's mom look at, looked after me. So, um, so uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have him uh, with us uh, today. And uh, we look forward to your presentation, Randall. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> that was, I didn't know the trivia about the, uh, that you went to. Uh, I think it was either Mother's Day Out or Kids Day Out um, program. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I just wanna, I wanna thank, start off by thanking uh, you all for hosting me today. Uh, so like many other American evangelicals in the first half of the 20th century, white holiness and Pentecostal believers claim to have little interest in politics. Uh, such calculated indifference could extend to the broader society too. And this was especially the case in the early part of the century. And accordingly, Edith Blumhofer observed that early Pentecostals tended to profess little interest in society and they often regarded major political, social, and intellectual transitions as significant primarily because of how they seemed to fit the prophetic agenda most Pentecostals subscribe to. At times, uh, Pentecostals and holiness people even denigrated politics as a meaningless distraction or a harmful pursuit. Evangelism, church growth, and the urgency of the second coming from this point of view trumped all else. Not long after the 1932 election of President Franklin Roosevelt, for instance, the Assemblies of God's magazine included a short piece by a British Pentecostal to make such a point. Uh, all kinds of government are failing, warned DG uh, Davis. Autocratic, Republican, Soviet, and Democratic governments all seem doomed to fail. Only one can succeed, he reassured. That is the God appointed one, which is a Christocracy. Yet in another sense, uh, white holiness people and Pentecostals were avowedly political, if not typically partisan. Believers took firm stands on war and social justice. They called for the federal and state banning of the sale of alcohol. They often opposed labor unions and membership in secret societies and perhaps most notably with their heavy focus on missions and global evangelism, they care deeply about world affairs and the shocks of war and political upheaval. Certainly the faithful placed disruptive political events alongside wars, natural disasters, economic trouble and famines in their vision of the end of the world. And if one thinks of politics as less a matter of partisanship, elections and voter participation and more a matter of power and the public good, then there were many ways that holiness people and Pentecostals acted politically. So this talk focuses today on anti-communism and anti-Catholicism with a little more emphasis on the former of those. And that's to understand more about a particular kind of political engagement and public concern. Holiness and Pentecostal denominations developed robust arguments against communism and Catholicism and sometimes those overlapped. These two forces posed in the eyes of believers serious threats to missions, national integrity, the American government, and personal morality. Such concerns place believers in a wider 
context of a shared Cold War experience with other Americans. The climate of fear, anti-communism and anti-Catholicism generated is still a key feature of 21st century white evangelical politics. Yet decades, decades before politicized white believers rallied to the Republican party over issues like abortion, gay marriage, school curriculum, immigration policy and other culture war topics. Many found communism to be one of the most pressing national and international problems of the day. The individual religious lives and so-called private morality of Pentecostals and Holiness people shaped how they understood cultural and political conflicts. And to borrow from the radical feminist Carol Hanisch's 1969 formulation, for these believers, the personal was political. To, to understand more about the ways that believers express themselves politically, I'm looking primarily at influential large white holiness and Pentecostal groups with a special focus on the Assemblies of God and the Church of the Nazarene. African-American and Latino churches express themselves politically in a different fashion. With a stronger tradition of social protest and activism, the African-American Church of God in Christ took another path than the white Assemblies of God denomination. With such exceptions, anti-communism did not have the same kind of, of, of place um, within black communities that it had within white ones. And it certainly did not dominate the attention of black believers as it did white adherents. Early holiness and Pentecostal stalwarts, whether black or white, tended to have a kind of populist understanding of authority and power. And this may have played into their visceral reaction against partisan politics and their dim view of what the two major parties represented. It also made them leery of powerful liberal and leftist elites in the government, in educational institution, institutions, and in the churches. Calvin White notes that the Church of God in Christ took root in part as a social protest against elite mainstream African-American churches. On the West Coast, early members of the Church of the Nazarene proudly referred to one of their humble sanctuaries as the, Glo the glory barn. The Chicago Pentecostal minister, William Hamner Piper, summed up a common sentiment about the movement's origins, writing in 1911, Somebody poured a little contempt some time ago upon Azusa Street Mission because it was in a barn. But God doesn't care a snap whether one seeks him in a barn or in a palace. Fears of powerful elites with hidden agendas and worries about an overbearing government drove some of the early reactions against communism, socialism, and left-leaning Protestantism. At times of political and social strife, responses were more intense. And this also applied to other Americans as well. So that would include the era of the Palmer raids in 1919 and 1920 that followed the Russian Revolution, the expansion of the USSR in the post-World War II years, the era of McCarthyism in the early 50s. And here's an image of McCarthy with a map of alleged communist organizations across the US. And then a revived sorry. wave of, oh, sorry. Sorry, can I, sorry to interrupt, Randall. Do you yes. do you intend to have your PowerPoint up now? Because we can't see it at the moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you just saying about an image? I just wondered. Yes. You wondered, yeah, sorry. sorry if you that. want to share screen at the bottom and then click on that. Yes, you should... that's, I think oh, my share, sorry about that. I think my share screen that's... came off there. Is that, that's can you see? Um, okay. So now yeah. I'll put that back up. Sorry about that's that. Right. Brilliant. The previous Thank you. one. Sure. This is a, this previous slide when I was talking about the, um, the Church of the Nazarene referring to this, that one of their sanctuaries as a glory barn. This is a great image. Walker Evans, uh, a Depression era photographer, took of the um, Church of the Nazarene, a, 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 a humble um, congregation from the late 1930s. So the image I was referring to is this one here of uh, Joseph McCarthy in um, Washington, D.C. with this, uh, these uh, images, this image of um, a map and alleged communist organizations. So in the 1910s and 1920s, leaders of the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostal Holiness Church, for instance, warned lay people of the serious dangers of atheistic movements. Bolsheviks and members of the radical 
uh, labor organization, the industrial workers of the world were hurting the faith and damaging the nation. And such suspicions uh, would only grow in the coming decades. So not surprisingly, Stalwarts often criticized Franklin D. Roosevelt for his radical initiatives. And this is a, an illustration here, Growing Tentacles uh, by Jack Ham in the Pentecostal Evangel from uh, 1961. And shows Karl Marx as a kind of octopus with tentacles that are surrounding the globe. Other worries and suspicions were widespread and growing. A 1947 Gallup poll asked Americans if membership in the Communist Party should be outlawed. And I put the poll up there on the screen. 61% uh, said that it should. Six years later, another Gallup poll revealed mass support for Republican US Senator uh, from Wisconsin, Joseph McCarthy's anti-communist campaigning. When asked for their opinion on McCarthy, 50% of Americans uh, had a favorable impression of him. The fear and hostility that marked this era often resulted in the targeting of racial and ethnic minorities as well as homosexuals in something that's called the Lavender Scare. Members of labor um, unions and political dissenters were also targets often. In, in his study of, the, of domestic anti-communism in America, M.J. Healy notes that Americans had long worried about the fragility and durability of the Republic, the insecurities inseparable from a capitalist economy and a democratic polity, he remarked, doubtless contributed to this widespread conviction that the American Republic was forever imperiled by enemies within. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, a series of shocking events made Americans even more troubled about communism, holiness and Pentecostal people among them. This was the era in which China became communist, the Soviets developed an atomic bomb, and authorities in England uncovered a major spy ring. In the US, the government convicted communist leaders through the Smith Act, and a federal grand jury indicted high profile former State Department official Alger Hiss on perjury charges related to espionage. In response, the aging newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst ran red scare pieces in his national papers. The Daughters of the American Revolution and the Knights of Columbus called the country to arms against atheistic communism. Millions of Americans feared that shadowy figures were trying to radicalize their country. A mid 1950s poll asked Americans, what do communists believe in? And the largest percentage answered that communists were, quote, against religion. The theme of communism as a false religion was common within holiness and Pentecostal circles. And this added uh, special urgency to the issue. Ministers and officials described the conflict with the Soviet Union as a spiritual battle. The Pentecostal healing evangelist from Portland, Oregon, Thomas Wyatt, made anti-communism one of the key themes of his 1950s pioneering television program. Wyatt, like others in the movement, preached that communism was a satanic inverted faith. Communism is a spiritual force, he declared to his viewers, and can be conquered only by a superior spiritual force. The Church of the Nazarene turned to the nation's leading law enforcement officer, J. Edgar Hoover, to make a similar case. Like other evangelicals, the Nazarenes published editorials by the FBI director in its denominational magazine. Um, for instance, Christianity Today, you know, sort of the flagship of uh, evangelicalism in the US also published quite a few of Hoover's editorials. Uh, American ministers, Hoover's told Nazare Hoover told Nazarenes, hold a vital place in the fight against communism. <clears throat> Church officials knew uh, what this atheistic enemy can and will do to the souls of men, he said. Evangelist Billy Graham, who also appeared in Holiness and Pentecostal publications like Hoover did, relied on Hoover's expertise in his sermons and in his published work. Few were as influential in anti-communist crusading in the early 1950s as Graham was. America's most well-known revivalist warned that the world was choosing between Karl Marx and Jesus Christ. We are told, said Graham in 1951, that there are over 1,100 social sounding organizations that are communist uh, and communist operated in this country. So in language that paralleled McCarthy, uh, his McCarthy's 1950 
Wheeling, West Virginia speech about communists in government service. Graham wondered aloud about this invasion and what it meant for the country. Communism was a vast, powerful, counterfeit religion, said Graham. It had its own sacred texts. It demanded converts and it promised redemption. Heeding the words of Graham and Hoover, holiness people and Pentecostals took stock of the fear that gripped the country of which a home and community bomb shelters were a visible sign. Development seemed to point to the last days for many of them. They observed the expansion of the Soviet state into Eastern Europe after the war and the proxy wars and conflicts in the Southern hemisphere. Martin Luther Davidson, a popular evangelist in the, in the uh, Assemblies of God denomination, delivered a series of sermons in the 1940s, 50s and 60s on the dangers of communism and the signs of the last days. At a service at Memphis, Tennessee's First Assembly of God in October 1949, Davidson preached on the red dragon of communism. He asked, is communism an end time sign and explored communism in the light of Bible prophecy? And it's quite possible, interestingly enough, that a young Elvis Presley and his parents who were also attending this church at the time were present for this special service. And I put up here a, uh, an advertisement for that, that particular service. Speculation on how a nuclear war would fit into prophecy was also quite common. Providing some sliver of hope, a former Assembly of God pastor and healing evangelist David Nunn reasoned that God has reserved the earth for his judgment. Man will not destroy the world. Only a minority of Christians shared the, spe the special kind of, or the specific kind of millennialism that so invigorated Pentecostals and holiness folk. Yet as Grant Wacker has pointed out, in many ways, stalwarts were quite like other Americans in general and other evangelicals in particular. That was the case, even though evangelicals harbored some serious doubts, non-Pentecostal evangelicals harbored doubts about Pentecostals, for instance. Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians denounced communism from their pulpits, on the radio, and on television. Indeed, anti-communism was such a powerful force in American life that it's difficult to make too many generalizations about it. There were liberal anti-communists in the post-war era like Arthur Schlesinger, the historian, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., and members of the uh, Americans for Democratic Action. Other stalwarts included Catholic celebrities like Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, union leader, uh, Walter Ruther, and new right activist and author and anti-feminist Phyllis Schlafly. But there were some distinguishing features, I think, that marked um, holiness and Pentecostal groups. Their denominations with a heavy emphasis on global evangelism were not only concerned with the spread of communism in the U.S., they were particularly worried that communists uh, would disrupt and destroy their work on the world mission field. In the 1950s, uh, the Christian and Missionary Alliance regularly addressed the terror of communism in its denominational journal. The Assemblies of God held their World Missions Convention at the Will Rogers Memorial Auditorium in Fort Worth, Texas in March 1956, and there the radio evangelist C.M. Ward told those gathered that missionaries were on the front lines facing off against red foes. By this point, Ward's popular ABC radio network Revival Time program aired every Sunday to uh, audiences through over 360 stations. If it were not for America's missions work, Ward assured, assured the Fort Worth crowd, the Iron Curtain would encircle the globe. Nazarenes also heavily invested in missions and global outreach had similar concerns. In the election year of 1960, the Church of the Nazarene issued an official report on communism. It specifically pointed out the hostility that missionaries faced in communist controlled countries. The denomination made clear that it would that it was, quote, unalterably opposed to godless communism and its atheistic oppression throughout the world, close quote. On the home front, conservative white Christians often tied communism to domestic disorder and lawlessness. Conservatives and those on the far right linked the modern civil rights movement, for instance, to communism. That was a very typical thing to see in the 50s and 60s. In the language of white fundamentalists, for instance, the struggle for black equality was compromised by political radicals and deviants. This had long been a powerful tool used by segregationists 
Strom Thurmond, South Carolina governor and 1948 presidential candidate for the Dixiecrat Breakaway Party, held a typical white Southern view on race, communism, and American politics. In August 1948, he thundered, quote, the so-called civil rights program, uh, which this Truman administration is trying to foist upon the country has its origin in communist ideology, close quote. Such ultra conservative views were relatively common among fundamentalists and to a lesser extent evangelicals. For example, 11 years after Thurman made these remarks, Southern Baptist professor E. Earl Ellis reviewed Martin Luther King's stride toward freedom in Christianity today. And here Ellis wrote that he was convinced that communism is implicit in Martin Luther King's integrationist ideology. Pentecostals and holiness people judging from the written record were not as likely to paint the civil rights movement red as their more avowedly right-wing brethren did. Still, there is some evidence that holiness and Pentecostal believers were linking red subversion to campaigns for black equality. In 1964, the year of the, the Transformational Civil Rights Act, one white Midwestern Nazarene pastor told a sociologist in the denomination that churches should fight integration as long as possible. Integration efforts in his view, quote, come by political force and the socialistic and communistic element has pushed it to divide our thinking and living, which they envy and hate, close quote. There's also evidence that I found that holiness and Pentecostal churches, white ones, opened their doors wide to far right anti-communist preachers and read their extremist literature. A newspaper editor in Madison, Wisconsin, took note when the Assembly of God Church in town invited the white nationalist, Kenneth Goff, to speak about communism in its congregation. The critic wondered if church members really knew of Goff's awful reputation. Goff, after all, quote, has been a lieutenant of Gerald L.K. Smith, one of the most prominent leaders of the anti-Semitic movement in the country, close quote. And Goff actually spent much of his energies criticizing the civil rights movement as a communist plot to force integration and promote interracial marriage. One Goff pamphlet from 1958 titled Reds Promote Racial War featured on its cover an African-American man dancing with a blonde white woman. And regardless of Goff's widely known hateful views on African-Americans and Jews, Numerous holiness and Pentecostal churches hosted Goff as a speaker from the 50s until his death in 1972. And those included the Church of the Nazarene, uh, Assemblies of God churches, uh, Foursquare Church, Christian Missionary Alliance, and, and others. Looking back on the civil rights era in the mid 1970s, Donald Dayton recalled the prevalence of conservative politics and anti communism on the Wesleyan Methodist campus of Houghton College in Western New York, where he was an undergraduate at the time. Like most evangelicals of the decade, Dayton remembered, we supported Richard Nixon and Barry Goldwater. Our great fear was communism and we found signs of its influence everywhere. We believed that the protest movements were manipulated by communist agitators and editorials in the Houghton College student newspaper in these years were um, had scattered references to communist threats and internal subversives. The anti-communist efforts of evangelicals, holiness people, and Pentecostals culminated in the early 1960s when Dayton was in college. This was also an era when such white believers focused on another threat, Catholicism, which they similarly viewed as authoritarian, alien, and a powerful force that endangered America at the highest levels of government. Such fears of popery had long animated the faithful. In the first decades of the 20th century, members of the Church of the Nazarene imagined that Roman Catholic immigrants were the source of political corruption, crime, and vice in American cities. White evangelicals and fundamentalists targeted Irish, German, and Italian immigrants for their bars and breweries that dotted America's growing cities. Holiness folk and Pentecostals made connections between the oppressiveness of communism and the tyranny of Catholicism. Pentecostals opposed having a U.S. envoy to the Vatican under Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. Such, such a position, thought critics, violated sep separation of church and state principles and even seemed to endorse the Catholic oppression of Protestants. In 1941, Church of God Cleveland editor responding to the Vatican envoy 
bluntly remarked, why send an ambassador to represent us at a purely spiritual headquarters of the Catholic Church? Evangelists and church officials also pointed to the influence and pressures of Catholicism and communism. From his base in Los Angeles, the eccentric healing preacher O.L. Jaggers claimed in 1953 that communists had craftily worked their way into America's churches. The theme of red infestation of liberal Protestantism, Protestantism along with the links between authoritarian and expansionist Catholicism dominated the arguments that white fundamentalists like Carl McIntyre, Billy James Hargis and others made. Similarly, an Assemblies of God missionary in French West Africa warned in 1948 that Catholicism and communism are swiftly advancing and by money, deceit, and force are winning thousands of souls that we have claimed for Christ. Edith Blumhofer drew these developments together, noting that by 1961, Assemblies of God leaders were firmly committed to the evangelical consensus of the National Association of Evangelicals. In the Eisenhower and Kennedy years, the denomination, she said, shared fully the anti-communism, anti-Catholicism, and anti-ecumenism of other NAE members. Disturbed by cultural trends toward federation and international organizations, they shared as well, she says, Senator Joseph McCarthy's absorption with communist conspiracy. Believers might have quibbled with McCarthy's ruthless tactics, uh, his Catholicism even, and his grandstanding, but many were convinced by what he was saying. It's gonna go forward a bit uh, here, sorry. Um, others with, uh, within the wider uh, world of evangelicalism weighed in on the distressing connections between Catholicism and communism and the politicization of the faithful. There was a piece in Christianity Today in 1961 in which the ed an editor speculated about this current uh, upsurge in right-wing um, activity. And he thought that the, the ultra-right had kind of gone into hibernation following the demise of Senator McCarthy, but with um, a new kind of push of the John Birch Society, which there's a, a picture of here, this is a radical anti-communist organization that, that uh, was prominent across the country at the time, along with Billy James Hargis's Christian Crusade in Tulsa. And uh, he said, with a Catholic president, uh, a Catholic running for president in 1960 against Richard Nixon, who had, uh, of course, a Quaker background, was also something that was quite threatening. Sorry, I've switched, go ahead a little bit here. Uh, the Pentecostal evangelist, evangel quoted a Southern Baptist leader with approval a couple of months before the heated 1960 election. The nomination of Kennedy was jarring, said the editor of the Arkansas Baptist. Uh, we are not against Catholicism, he wrote, as a religious faith. Yet for this Arkansas editor, Roman Catholicism is more than a religion. It is totalitarianism with a world organization centering in a foreign land and denying the right of any religion to exist outside its own hierarchy. So the threats posed by communism and Catholicism were shockingly similar. For those troubled by Kennedy's candidacy, Soviet expansion and sinister red agents in the US, the signs were clear enough. The Pentecostal Church of God Cleveland, uh, headquartered in the great Appalachian Valley remained rather apolitical in the decades before the Cold War. But in 1960, there's this sort of upsurge in political activity and statements made officially by the Church of God Cleveland General Assembly uh, on both uh, Catholicism and communism. The National Association of Evangelicals gathered for their annual convention in April 1960. Uh, the meeting addressed some of the many issues that animated holiness and Pentecostal groups. It also officially opposed the election of any Roman Catholic as a U.S. president. While it, all, it simultaneously deplored communist infiltration of the churches and opposed recognition of red China. Interestingly enough, it was um, headed in these years by the Pentecostal minister, Thomas F. Zimmerman, who launched a campaign to send letters to 160,000 pastors across the country, drawing attention to, to the Catholic issue and trying to stir up support uh, for the Republican candidate. 
In the decades that followed, much of the hostility to, to Catholicism would diminish, but the opposition to political, theological, and cultural liberalism would grow even stronger. Conservative Protestants and Catholics found common cause in the culture wars of the post-1960s era. Decades of strident anti-communism led to an even more defensive posture for white holiness people and Pentecostals. After the Red Crusades of the post-war years, believers drew new boundaries between themselves and liberal Protestants, secular intellectuals, and what many perceived to be a godless democratic party. Anti-communism when combined with pre-millennialism made believers suspicious of a whole range of presumed enemies of the faith. With few exceptions, they were increasingly suspicious of the liberal establishment and intellectual elites. Something that uh, Carl Guyerson, my co-author and I wrote about in our book, uh, The Anointed. Since holiness folk and Pentecostals identified the Soviet Union and communism as sources of evil and danger on the world stage, they came to associate the cause of the United States with justice and moral clarity. In their sermons, books, and periodicals in the 50s and 60s, there was a new form of hyper-patriotism on display and Christian nationalism as well. It's little wonder then that many in the Assemblies of God and the Church of the Nazarene, like other white evangelicals, supported the U.S. war in Vietnam. And I want to conclude here uh, by going a little bit forward in time now. By the late 1970s and 1980s, holiness people, Pentecostals, even Catholics, and some conservative Jews joined the Reagan revolution. Ronald Reagan's anti-communist crusading as an actor, a governor of California and a forceful cold warrior was certainly not lost on adherence. James G. Watt, a longstanding member of the Assemblies of God served as Reagan's secretary of the interior. Another in the denomination, John Ashcroft served as, served as Republican governor of Missouri, US Senator, and then later as George W. Bush's attorney general. Holiness folk and Pentecostals supported nonprofit groups like the Moral Majority that directly and indirectly aided the Republican cause. Another one of these groups, Christian Voice, a right-wing California-based advocacy group founded in 1979, grew to 150,000 lay members and 3,000 clergy by the mid-1980s. And a very large portion of this group um, was represented by Assemblies of God ministers. New issues would inspire activism in later decades. The faithful called for the overturning of the Supreme Court's decision on prayer in public schools, opposed abortion and homosexual rights, and decried liberal school curriculum and an immoral entertainment industry. White holiness people and Pentecostals came to associate more and more with the GOP. For instance, a 2014 Pew Research Center study found that members of the Church of the Nazarene along with Mormons were most likely to identify with the Republican Party when compared to other major denominations. That survey revealed that 63% of Nazarenes lean toward or identify with the GOP. Members of the Assemblies of God were not far behind with 57% leaning Republican. And we'll, I'll take a look, show you this in the last slide here in a moment, see how it breaks down. Uh, this was contrasted sharply with the political preferences of the Church of God in Christ, an African-American Pentecostal denomination, a mere 14% of its members identified with or leaned Republican. The turn to the political right and the Republican Party continued into more recent years. And I think that move had its roots in the anti-Kennedy, anti-Catholic campaign of 1960 and this longer standing um, uh, sort of skirmishes about or and battles about communism in the pre and post-war years. So take a look at this uh, here at the end. I'll just pull that up. Um, I think that's probably large enough for you to see it. You can see this is uh, the red shows, the sort of pinkish red shows uh, the, the lean toward the Republican Party in this massive survey that was undertaken in 2014. And the um, LDS at the top, the Mormons at the top, the Church of the Nazarene, second here, kind of unsurprisingly, the Southern Baptist Convention, which has about 15 million members in the US, uh, is in the third position, the conservative Lutheran Missouri Synod, and then Assemblies of God here. And then if we go all the way down to the bottom, uh, we see, um, let's see, maybe it's not on the screen, actually. Oh, there it is, Church of God in Christ at 14 right next to Unitarian Universalist and 
I think very surprising is that actually more atheists lean uh, Republican than than those in, in Kojic do. Anyway, that's uh, all I have. I'll go ahead and stop my presentation um, at that point, if I can find a way to. Yeah, and uh, stop the um, stop the share screen. Uh, I wanted to to try to keep it a little bit shorter so there'd be some time for any kind of questions or, or conversation about this, but uh, thanks so much for your time. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Randall. That gives us a good amount of time for uh, questions and discussion. Um, really stimulating talk and uh, a lot of uh, good illustrations to, uh, to go with it uh, as well. So um, if you want to use the uh, raise hand feature, that's the common thing that uh, we've done, but uh, I think I've got you all on one screen. So uh, however you wanna uh, indicate that uh, you have a question. Uh, I'll, I'll start with one while everyone else is uh, thinking. Um, I was wondering, Randall, I mean, particularly the, those, uh, the statistics that you gave at the end are, are just so striking. Uh, and I think one of the things that raises is, you know, was, it, was the re is the real underlying issue and overarching issue race and racism and uh, the anti-communism and anti-Catholicism is a, a kind of manifestation of that overarching issue uh, in some ways. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a good point. I mean, there's a, a really new book that's generating some controversy that Anthea Butler has written uh, about white evangelical racism that focuses heavily on race. And then of course, Another one that came out about the same time is uh, Kristen Cobes Dumez, her book called, it's got a great um, pre-colon title, Jesus and John Wayne, where she looks at hyper-masculinity and uh, chauvinism and uh, makes a point of that. I think um, I, I've written a, a chapter on sort of the larger world of white evangelicalism, um, where I made a, a, some of these connections to politics. And I, I think it's it's in this, this longer past, it's something that, that hasn't really been talked about too much, it's sort of unacknowledged road to one of the roads to politics, I think. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, Rob Ray, you have a question? Thank you, what a fascinating topic. It's uh, really, really interesting. Um, I was just curious whether, um, whether you, it's particularly in some of the early developments, um, whether you had a sense of if this is driven by leaders who are capitalizing on a, a kind of a grassroots feeling um, or whether it is uh, something kind of uh, imposed from above, I suppose. So kind of identifying a potential um, external enemy that can help unite uh, you know, and promote kind of denominations that uh, I realize that may not be possible for you to kind of tease out <laughs> very easily. Um, but yeah, I was just curious whether there was any kind of, <laughs> any kind of direct sense of that. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it, it's, you know, in a way the sources we use, I think as historians dictate some of this because, you know, I've used a lot of the denominational uh, journals, magazines, and in that you're seeing a lot of the leaders that are writing uh, there. But I've also tried to use other sources like, uh, you know, local regional newspapers where you can see sometimes regular people, uh, their, their thoughts about these matters. So it's in the case, I mean, we have parallel organizations that had a number of evangelical fundamentalists who are part of them that were definitely grassroots movements like the John Birch Society had a really strong kind of grassroots presence and same, the same with um, Billy James Hargis's Christian Crusade, which is a Sunbelt phenomenon uh, and had a lot of strength in the West and, and uh, the, the border South. But that's a good question. <laughs>
Mm, thank you. I think Jordan, you're muted. Yeah, so yeah, I think I saw you, uh, David Rainey, uh, raising your hand. So you wanna ask a question? Okay, Randall, this is an absolutely fascinating subject that you're on. I grew up in the 50s and 60s and knew this sort of stuff. So I'll, I'll ask a question of, of a perhaps a social critic that I think was in the evangelical movement. We didn't know who this guy was, the French social critic Jacques Ellul. In my 20s, I was collecting his writings. And I remember the importance that they taught us to read Jacques Ellul. I don't think anyone knew he was a Marxist, but a Christian. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, we were encouraged to read this technological society and anatomy of a revolution and this sort of social criticism. Did we miss this guy completely? We didn't know who he was. That's a, that's a, that's a really good point. I think that I, I have found when, when say people in the church of the Nazarene in the 50s and 60s, when they, when they sort of sensed the, the leftist or even socialist communist underpinnings of, of certain authors, they tended to go on the attack about it. Like the, uh, in the early 1960s, Carl Bangs yeah. wrote this piece in Herald of Holiness where he said, if we really want to understand communism, we should be reading these kinds of works. And there were some authors who were associated with the National Council of Churches, and it created this huge controversy. Yeah. Billy James Hargis wrote to Herald of Holiness, to, and there were letters that were coming in, and uh, I didn't know about that in, until Stan Ingersoll told me about it at the archives in KC, but, but I think typically it, when people knew, when church authorities knew about these connections and backgrounds, they reacted pretty negatively to it. Right, right. It's just a fascinating, I, uh, growing up, I dated a girl from Memphis, Tennessee, and she taught me how Martin Luther King was a communist. Mm -hmm. And she was living in Canada at the time. And of course, in my fundamentalist viewpoint, I had no idea about uh, this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it now it makes sense what they were what was going on yeah. in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And that it was normal. This was normal stuff. So anyway, anyway, I'll leave it, but I it's mm -hmm. a fascinating lecture that you've just given. Oh, thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, Joe Brennan. Great, thank you, Jordan. Um I'm, I'm with David. This is just truly a fascinating uh, lecture. Thank you so much for, for this oh, paper. Thanks. Yeah, I, I have uh, two questions, so I'll, I'll just uh, rifle them both off. They're rather unrelated, but I'll touch on them and ask if you can comment on, on both of them. Yeah. The first one was just, an, and it's towards the end of your lecture where you talked about um, the Kennedy presidency. So the first question was, did we see, in your view, a uh, uh, a, a softening of anti-Catholic sentiment um, with the Kennedy presidency, and then, of course, with his assassination, you know, as well. And then the second question was on the graph that you showed at the very mm -hmm. end that Jordan had just uh, commented on. Um, I just find it interesting that um, we still see uh, a, primarily a, a a Jewish leaning, uh, you know, towards the Democratic Party, even in spite of um, the typical pro-Israel uh, GOP uh, yeah. stance. So they're they're rather unrelated. But could you touch on the two of them first, Kennedy, and then the uh, the the Jewish and, and leaning towards Democratic Party? Yeah, yeah, that's a great. Those are great questions. And you know, the the sociologist at Princeton, Robert Withnow, has written about this this fascinating process of how evangelicals and Catholics, you know, found common purpose uh, politically in the night by the 1970s, but some of that was already underway in the 1960s. 
And I think Kennedy's presidency maybe had something to do with it. Um, they, when you look at the kind of breakdown of evangelicals, a lot of times their politics and whether they voted Democrat or Republican tended to have to do with where they were in the country. And since Nazarenes had a strength in the, the, on the Great Plains, the old Midwest and the West, they, they skewed Republican. Now, related to that, I mean, for, for decades and decades, Catholics and Jews had been some of the strongest supporters of the, of the Democratic Party. Gallup polling did these polls in the 1930s when they started. I think they started about 1935 of uh, support of Roosevelt and his presidency. And the highest percentage typically were Catholics and Jews. And part of it had to do with a kind of urban presence and the strength of the Democratic Party in urban settings. Um, and it's, you know, especially when the, the modern Democratic Party is formed as a part of the Roosevelt coalition in the 30s. That's, I think that's when you have that kind of hard and fast support of Jews and Catholics. Yeah. Thank you. That's, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Joshua. Uh, thanks, Dr. Hammond. Really appreciated this paper. Uh, technical question, um, and it's mm -hmm. kind of a similar question I actually have with Dumez and how she defines evangelicism, but how are you defining um, Pentecostalism? Because I was a little yes. thrown with using Nazarene and the Christian Missionary Alliance in those definitions. So just curious how you're going about that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm sorry if that didn't come through clearly. I'm, I'm definitely defining Nazarene and Christian, well, Nazarenes particularly as holiness. Christian and Missionary Alliance is a little bit different, but I, I still would think that we're on the kind of holiness side. But in, in my view, you know, and, and when I kind of, kind of defined it in my first book or tried to, I focus on uh, speaking in tongues, healing, the, the style of worship to, to, um, to think about Pentecostals being different than uh, other evangelicals. And I think that that's, it's a great question about evangelicalism because I think it's a sort of interesting place that we're in right now. Uh, a lot of people kind of moving beyond how David Bebbington defined evangelicalism for a long time. Now it's, there's uh, other considerations about race, gender, um, class, uh, cultural and political factors that are, take us outside of the sort of heady realm of, of theological definitions. I hope that kind of answers it. Yeah, super helpful. It, 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 with Dumez, it was, it's interesting because she kind of merges the more fuller, if I can use that as a broad category, stream of evangelicism with almost the fundamentalist Bob Jones stream. And it was, I just never had experienced the merging of those yeah. two in education up to that point. So yeah, you're super helpful. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Wendy. Yeah, thank you. Interesting paper. Um, I My question is regarding the treatment of the missionaries in the communist um, parts of the world, you know, where they were serving and how that how that's defined. Was it about, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what that's about. Is it actual poor treatment that they're documenting? Is it what they perceive to be a lack of reception yeah. of the gospel? You know, I just am curious yeah. about that. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think it's, I mean, they, they really had a, a good point. These were oppressive regimes. They were authoritarian and they experienced just terrible hardships on the mission field from a, uh, you know, a kind of avowedly state-sponsored secularism that targeted missionaries. But I, I mean, interestingly, there were, there are similar kinds of things being said in about countries that are um, majority Catholic or are, you know, state Catholic sponsored countries about the oppressiveness and about sort of the problems that they face in, in um, uh, fulfilling their purposes on the ground. But I, in the chapter, I want to try to capture that, like, there are real reasons to be anti-communist in, in the 19, late 1940s, 50s, and 60s that aren't just sort of imagined and, um, some kind of ho collective hallucination. And it, the, the mission field is, you know, for these churches, the mission field is one way to illustrate that. 
Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Randall, just uh, relating to some of what you touched on, um, one of the other things I was wondering is, um, you know, as you kind of indicated, the, the anti-Catholicism seemed to diminish quite rapidly, although, um, you know, it's, it's still lingered in some ways, you know, I've seen it in my lifetime uh, as well in, in holiness and mm -hmm. Pentecostal churches, um, but the strength of it seems to have really waned. Um, I'm just wondering whether um, you think Vatican II may have been another factor, um, you know, particularly with, um, you know, growing recognition that uh, Catholics uh, maybe weren't, uh, uh, you know, completely owing their allegiance to a foreign power and uh, as well the, yeah. the recognition at Vatican II uh, of, uh, you know, true believers in uh, denominations uh, outside of Catholicism. I yeah. don't know if that's, dis that's discussed in the literature that you've seen or, or anything. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. I, th I think that with now talks about that. I mean, it's certainly, it, it's a kind of a, it's a concrete factor for, and it's one of the reasons why the sixties is, is the beginning of this turning point. Um, there's also the, the, the classic book from the fifties, Will Herberg's, Protestant Catholic Jew of talking about the kind of commonalities that these traditions share. And I think that some of that shades also into America's civil religion. That's the sort of this, this more kind of broad conception of how religion works in the public. And it doesn't really matter if you're Catholic, Jewish, Christian in, in that sense, but certainly Vatican II does have something to do with it. And that, Reminds me, that's something I probably should put into the chapter uh, in that short section about the transformation. Ooh. So thanks for that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Dwight, sorry, I didn't, I, um, your hand really blends in there, so I missed, missed it, but uh, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you. I, it, I realized that uh, it's, it's not a white, white man's hand. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, like uh, Dave Rainey, I uh, grew up through this particular period, so I have some vivid memories, and that was in bed, Bread Basket Bible Belt, America. And so there's just a couple things I thought might help a little bit. One is, uh, it, it, I think it's very, very difficult to grasp if you're not, if you were, if you were born since 1989, the... Um, Iron Curtain, the, the threat of nuclear annihilation, uh, in which as school children, we had uh, uh, practices of, of evacuation and uh, in case of a nuclear attack. So we, we lived under that burden uh, in the post-war period growing up from the very beginning. So uh, that's, a, that's a widespread. That's it's not uh, uh, a Christian thing, obviously. And, um, and then, uh, so I think things need to be, be seen as part of, of that wider culture in that respect. It's not, uh, I, I don't, I, 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 it's what you have shown us, I, I can see as being uh, valid, but I, I think to see that it is not totally different from uh, wider worries and concerns at the time. Uh, the question about whether Kennedy's election made things easier for Catholics, absolutely not. Uh, I, knew, I knew people who were quite pleased when he was killed. Uh, hmm. And uh, so it, it, it's, uh, yeah. And as I made in a note, uh, the, you know, the Southern Democrats, you know, when I went to um, Southern Nazarene University, I was totally shocked to discover Christians who were Democrats because I, you know, you know, it couldn't be both. And, but, um, but, but, but interestingly enough, those very people whom were uh, prominently activist Democrats in the 19, early 1970s um, have subsequently are quite active Republicans 
because the Southern Democrat flip, they were, you know, uh, the issues that were espoused from Reagan on particularly were, were um, similar. So just a couple of things from being there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I guess um, I, I cut part of this out in the interest of time, but I, I have some stuff in there about the threat of nuclear war and what that meant to Americans. One thing I want to do is sort of extend what Grant Wacker has written about that, you know, it's, it's, it's too easy to think about Pentecostals and holiness people, for instance, of being so unlike other Americans, but in fact, they shared so much with other Americans that it's, um, and, and this is a part where they're kind of plugged into this larger context of the Cold War. But those, those are good points that you, you made, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, could I ask another question very briefly? Sure, we've got a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, where did Francis Schaefer fit into your thesis? Uh, he, I don't have him in there, but I, we did. Uh, Carl Guyberson and I wrote about him a bit in the in the book, The Anointed, and um, I actually talked about him a, a little bit in my book about music. But Schaefer, you know, Schaefer, I think, is rightly criticized really heavily now. But one thing that he did is he, he opened up white evangelicals to this broader world of ideas. Yeah. Um, I think it's something that Barry Hankins has written a great biography of Schaefer has written about. And then this former student of mine, uh, Austin Steelman, who's at Stanford doing his uh, PhD, he's writing about Schaefer and talks about some of these things, I think as well. Um, but he... I mean, since I'm focusing mostly on this, heavily concentrating on the late 40s through the 60s, uh, he doesn't loom that large for me. 